which longevity supplements actually work and which ones are very overhyped. This and a lot more I'll be covering in this Q&A episode. If you want to ask me a question, then make sure you follow me on Instagram at Seamland. It's showtime. All right, the first question is name some of the most overhyped uh, longevity supplements that aren't worth it. I have, I think I have probably made <laughs> at least a few videos about this topic on my channel, not specifically maybe like overhyped, but I have covered like what are the most expensive and like not worth it supplements in terms of the price on the channel. You can look it up on the, the search. You know, when we're talking about overhyped, then we have to still have to ground it in like evidence. You know, what I consider overhyped would be that people say that it does X or it's like super effective for some things and in the longevity space, it's going to be that this supplement is going to, you know, cure aging and make you live a lot longer. <laughs> and uh, the evidence doesn't support that. Or there's also some like, yeah, just mis misinformation about the magnitude of the effect or something else related. So that's what I would consider overhyped. And uh, there are certainly a lot of supplements in this field that uh, could be considered overhyped, you know, starting with Reservatrol, you know, NMN and nicotine riboside. To a certain extent, they're all overhyped because when people, you know, are listening to different kinds of, uh, let's say, scientists and uh, longevity influencers on social media, then, yeah, like when they hear about Reservatrol or NMN or something like that, then... You know, the reason they start to take, and take it is because they think that it's going to make them live longer and slow down aging. Now, there is no evidence as of now that it's true. Like, we don't have any evidence in even in animal studies that resveratrol or NMN or nicotinamide riboside that it would, uh, like, extend lifespan or that it would even slow down the biological aging. Obviously, it's uh, still early with at least NMN and nicotinamide riboside, but it's not early with uh, resveratrol. So resveratrol has been around, you know, even 20 plus years now, and we still don't have the evidence that it would uh, like work directly on lifespan or aging. And in fact, there is a lot of, you know, contrary evidence that it doesn't work even uh, doing that, even in animal studies. Like human studies are obviously completely different. We don't have almost any longevity supplements proven to work in humans. Uh, in terms of extending lifespan, of course, they work in some other ways by extending uh, like healthy biomarkers or like uh, slowing down some of the hallmarks of aging, which we'll cover later. But uh, in humans, it's obviously very complicated to, to know which ones actually work. Uh, but yeah, like even in animal studies, the resveratrol story is kind of debunked almost that uh, it can have in humans some effects for like maybe lipid profile or blood sugar management and those kind of things, but it certainly has no, let's say, life extension effects even in animals. And I don't think that it is true in uh, human studies uh, or in, in humans, it's not going to pan out uh, that way either. And it's certainly overhyped in terms of that. And I think the hype around the resveratrol is declining. It, it's certainly not as hyped as it was back in the early 2000s when it was first like discovered that, oh my God, these sirtuin activators, etc. You can check out my other video about resveratrol and sirtuins. But uh, yeah, the main short uh, the short story is that resveratrol doesn't really have like life extension effects even in animals, uh, and uh, yeah, it's it might have like some metabolic effects in humans, but uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, one of the most overhyped and it's certainly not cheap. Uh, it's uh, one of the more expensive supplements, and I think the price to benefit ratio for healthy people to for these biohackers who are taking resveratrol for life extension then it's certainly not worth it and a lot uh, has to do with over being overhyped over in my opinion with nmn and nicotine riboside then uh, at least in issue, as of now we don't have either like any life extension or longevity benefits what we find uh, with uh, nmn and nicotine riboside is that they can help with some aspects of you know metabolic health and also like hallmarks of aging or like functional decline so like nmn can affect like walking speed and those kind of things maybe cognition in the elderly uh, or insulin sensitivity but uh, you know does that characterize or does that account for actual life extension or longevity then yeah we don't know uh, in animals there are also not no studies showing that it would have those like life extension effects uh, when we're talking about nicotine riboside or uh, nmn so i think they're certainly overhyped but i do still find value in nad boosters in certain situations, specifically around circadian rhythm mismatch, if you have some chronic inflammation, if you have, you know, sleep deprivation, where your body would need to have more NAD, or you need to like recover from uh, decline in NAD levels, 
then uh, I would still find it useful even for healthy individuals to use it as a, like a short-term uh, booster, <laughs> for lack of a better word. But it doesn't, you know, the it's certainly overhyped because people think it's going to do things that it's not proven to do, if that makes sense. It's it works. It's a you know it it works in certain parameters of health, but it's uh, overhyped because it's not proven to actually have longevity benefits or it's not proven to have life extension benefits even in animals, if that makes sense. And I think I'll, I'll cap it at this point right now. The three most overhyped would be resveratrol, nicotinamide riboside, and NMN. And as a bonus, I'll maybe mention like spermidine is also pretty overhyped, not because that spermidine itself as a compound wouldn't be good. We have actually quite a nice data in human uh, like epidemiological studies and prospective studies that at least dietary spermidine intake is associated with reduced mortality and reduced Alzheimer's and heart disease even, but it's uh, the dietary spermidine, <laughs> not the, the supplemental spermidine. And many of these uh, supplement companies might, might make the leap thinking that just supplementing the spermidine is what is going to mediate those results. Um, but, but we just don't know that yet. We don't have the same evidence with supplemental spermidine when it comes to the effects of dietary spermidine on health. And, you know, it could also be that just the healthy foods that keep you healthy and help you to reduce your mortality risk, those foods generally also contain spermidine. So even then, you know, it's not specifically proven that spermidine itself as a compound has anti-aging uh, benefits. It might be that just the healthy foods that would make you healthier also contain spermidine. It's almost like a food that contains either protein, carbs, or fats is going to make you live longer. And, you know, all foods contain proteins, carbs, and fats to a certain extent, like in different ratios, obviously. But, you know, just saying that a food has a specific compound is what is going to give you the longevity benefits is, uh, is, a far fa is, is too, too big of a leap, in my opinion. You know, healthy foods contain many different compounds. They contain vitamins and minerals. They contain spermidine and they contain different kinds of amino acids etc and you know chances are it can be just the healthy foods that give you those health benefits not necessarily like a specific compound inside or it could also be just the sum of all parts like all the minerals and all the compounds inside healthy foods is what make them healthy <laughs> in in, uh, in certain amounts this episode is brought to you by alitura naturals alitura brings you the best natural skincare products for radiating skin and anti-aging regular skincare products are full of ingredients and fillers that actually cause more harm than good alitura uses only active ingredients sourced and handcrafted in hawaii their products contain zero fillers the alitura night cream received the 2021 clean cert beauty awards for best face cream alitura also has skin moisturizers, clay mask, serums, and cleansers. Head over to alitura.com and use the code SIM, S-I-I-M, for a 20% discount. And the next question is going to be the opposite of this. So like the supplements that actually have evidence, what is like the most evidence-based longevity supplements out there. I recently made an Instagram post about this as well. I listed out my like top five. Uh, obviously, there's, the list could be longer. There's maybe uh, a few more of the supplements that you could add there. But uh, in this context, I'll just uh, cap it out at five. So the top five are creatine, glycine, NAC, magnesium, and an omega-3 supplement in some form. And of course, I've talked a lot about glycine and NAC. Many people aren't surprised uh, about that. And the reason is simple. There is actually quite a lot of uh, human clinical trials showing that the glycine and NAC combo increases glutathione levels. And because of that, it helps to reverse the decline in functional aspects or that you know, happens with aging, like muscle strength, gait speed, cognition, and body composition status. Those things decline with age, and the glutathione increase through glynac helps to reverse that. And it also helps to reverse some of the hallmarks of aging related to like mitochondrial function, telomeres, cell senescence, and those kind of things. So that's, I think, that pretty good. Uh, you know, because you don't have that kind of evidence when we're talking about some other supplements. Like we definitely don't have it with resveratrol or NMN or nicotine riboside or even like vitamin C or some other like more older supplements. We don't have that kind of evidence, but we do have it with glycine and NECs, which is why I think it's one of the most evidence-based longevity supplement uh, for humans, at least. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether or not it's going to work in the elder, uh, like younger people, we don't know that uh, it probably you know, your glutathione levels start to decline after the age of 45. So chances are 
it's still more effective after the age of 45 than before. And, you know, someone in their 20s or 30s probably has little to nothing to gain from at least regular supplementation of Glynec. They might benefit from it periodically in certain situations, but they don't need to do it that frequently unless they are experiencing accelerated biological aging or they have some comorbidities like diabetes that reduces glutathione, metabolic syndrome that lowers uh, glutathione, so other, other kinds of inflammatory conditions that lower the glutathione status. But after the age of 45, when your body, you know, the glutathione decreases and your body is just experiencing this inflammation, as it's called age-related inflammation, then uh, at that point it's much, yeah, I think pretty much a daily thing I would take, uh, like a glycine and NAC combo uh, every day pretty much uh, after the age of uh, 45. Now creatine, creatine is certainly the most evidence-based sports supplement in the world. And because of that, I would suggest that it is, is yeah, probably like the most evidence-based supplement as a whole. Like it just uh, has a lot of research benefits specifically around sports performance, muscle strength, muscle power, and, uh, you know, muscle mass as well indirectly and kind of speed develop and those kind of things, anaerobic exercise performance. Uh, it comes down, it's, it's, yeah, like the top one supplement uh, for that by far. And you don't need any fa fancy like forms of creatine, just the regular creatine monohydrate does the trick. But uh, creatine also has a lot of longevity benefits, obviously maintaining muscle and maintaining muscle strength and muscle power is incredibly important for anti-aging and longevity because, you know, you with age, you do see a decrease in muscle mass and muscle strength, but you specifically, the biggest thing that you lose is type 2 muscle fibers. So the fast twitch muscle fibers, the speed, you lose the speed, which is, you know, a lot more important when we're talking about preventing falls and preventing hip fractures. So if you're falling off the stairs, then your slow twitch muscle fibers aren't going to save you that much. You need to have the fast twitch muscle fibers. You need to have the speed and agility and quickness to grab a hold of yourself and grab a hold of the staircase or something like that to prevent the falls. Creatine also has brain benefits. So there's a lot of creatine in the brain and your brain uses a lot of creatine to produce ATP and the you know demand for ATP is massive by the brain like your brain you know your brain consumes probably the most ATP in in relation to its uh, mass so your brain comprises only like you know less than five percent of your uh, total body weight but it consumes up to 20 percent of your total energy per day so it consumes a lot of ATP and creatine helps with a lot of let's say, aspects of cognitive function, as well as it has neuroprotective effects because of that as well. So your brain just uh, maintains better health uh, just by having higher creatine stores. And creatine supplementation has also been uh, shown to pretty much help with aspects of cognitive decline in the elderly, at least. And uh, lastly, creatine indirectly helps with longevity by reducing your sleep demand. And the Probably the biggest reason probably has to do with uh, how it affects your brain, creatine stores and energy production. So if your brain has more creatine stores, then uh, your demand for sleep also is lower. So you can get away with less sleep. Obviously, you do want to sleep <laughs> uh, as, uh, as much as you need. But with age, you see a decline in total sleep duration and sleep quality, which uh, is linked to melatonin production and the circadian rhythms, etc., but if you take, you know, create, and we have human studies showing that creatine supplementation, at, especially over a long period of time, reduces the sleep pressure or reduces like sleep demand. And it's also been found in athletes who uh, are experiencing sleep deprivation that the creatine supplementation uh, mitigates against or attenuates the negative side effects of sleep deprivation on performance. So w with sleep deprivation, you see a decline in your physical performance specifically like the fast switch performance, like the explosive performance, but with creatine supplementation, you can mitigate against that. So that's another, just a, I think a very simple for the elderly, especially who are sleeping worse, their sleep quality is worse, they sleep shorter, and th they're also more susceptible to cognitive decline and neurodegeneration, then creatine is like a nootropic or like a brain health supplement first and foremost. Uh, obviously, it has a lot of these physical performance benefits, which are just a bonus, I think. But for longevity purposes, then the biggest, uh, like, I think the biggest reason I would take creatine as an elderly person for longevity purposes would be the brain benefits and the, the sleep. Next supplement that I cover is going to be magnesium. So obviously, many people know the importance of magnesium. It's, I call the master mineral. 
it governs pretty much every function, every process inside the body. You need magnesium for energy production. You need magnesium for virtually every other process inside the body. And we have a lot of data suggesting that, you know, first of all, dietary magnesium intake is associated with reduced uh, heart disease and reduced mortality. But we also find that that magnesium status is like linearly associated with atherosclerosis. So the lower your magnesium status, then the greater burden of atherosclerosis there generally is. And the higher magnesium status, then the lower that uh, burden. So obviously, making sure that you eat plenty of foods that contain magnesium is the starter point. Pumpkin seeds, seafood, fish, uh, leafy greens, almonds, nuts, whatever kind of other uh, seeds and uh, things like that. But the issue is that most of the foods are very depleted of magnesium because the soil is depleted of magnesium and uh, certain food processing, etc., can also reduce the magnesium content. So a lot of people are magnesium deficient and it's hard to find magnesium from foods because of the same reasons that I just mentioned. You know, first of all, how many people eat pumpkin seeds on a regular basis? Uh, you could maybe get uh, a lot of magnesium from like if you eat oysters every day or something like that. But uh, again, it's... It's got to be hard to like reach the optimal intake of magnesium and uh, sometimes your magnesium requirement could be a lot higher than the rda so the rda is 420 milligrams but uh, let's say in a, st in a state of higher information higher stress which a lot of people are and uh, a lot of light a lot of things that deplete your magnesium like high high blood sugar levels uh, you know cortisol levels even like circadian rhythm mismatch artificial light exposure, all those things that increase oxidative stress and inflammation in the body or reduce your sleep quality, all those things just increase your magnesium demand. And chances are most people would actually benefit from a magnesium intake of like 600 or 700 milligrams per day. If you have some sort of a chronic disease like diabetes or hyperinsulinemia or hyperglycemia, then even 1000 milligrams could be you know, worthwhile. So that's why I think a magnesium supplement is such, such, a, such a simple and easy win you gain a lot of benefits and it's very safe. It's been, you know, repeatedly shown to have benefits, the magnesium status per se, and uh, reducing like the risk of incident cardiovascular disease and those kind of things. So I think it's just a, such, such a simple win with a huge upside. Like you gain a lot of, you know, the best or the, you know, the least you could, or the smallest things you could benefit from by taking a magnesium would be like better sleep or lower stress. And if you are someone who experiences those kind of things, then, you know, why not, why not take like a magnesium? And the last supplement that I'll mention is omega-3s. Obviously, you know, fish oil or supplementing fish oil is one of those things even like everyone's grandma knows <laughs> or they've heard that uh, supplementing fish oil is good for heart health and reducing uh, the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, which, uh, you know, in the t t totality of evidence is true. Like there are some studies finding that that uh, there, there is no effect in supplementing fish oil or omega-3s in reducing risk of uh, heart disease, but the totality of evidence suggests that uh, yes, it does. And uh, the omega-3s, specifically EPA and DHA, have a lot of health benefits in terms of lowering like inflammation, lowering oxidative stress, having insulin sensitizing effects, and uh, those kind of things. So if you just look at the totality of evidence, then it does suggest that, you know, I mean, I mean this, there's just so many trials repeatedly since, I don't know, like the 80s and 90s, uh, showing that, uh, yes, the, um, you know, in whatever form the omega-3s come from, whether that be fish oil or uh, like cold liver oil or some, something like that, uh, that the omega-3s, you want to just get a sufficient amount of EPA and DHA into your system every day. And that amount generally falls around, you know, 1.5 to 3 grams of EPA DHA combined per day is what generally is is the amount associated with the reduced mortality and what you also find is that people with the highest EPA and DHA levels in the blood have a significantly lower risk of heart disease significantly lower risk of all cause mortality and Alzheimer's disease and dementia as well all right next question is there an optimal time to train like after eating after walking after waking up or something like that Yes, there is, you know, if you were to live in a perfect world where you can always control your daily routine and your schedule, then, you know, at least depends on the type of training. So what we do know is that strength and power uh, peak in the afternoon from a circadian rhythm standpoint. So you are stronger and more explosive around 
4 to 5 p.m. in the afternoon than you are in the morning. So if you are some sort of a person who does powerlifting or weightlifting or you just want to hit larger numbers at the gym and you really want to optimize it, then yes, the best time to train would be around, you know, 3, 4, 5 p.m., something like that. Now, if you're the person who can't control the schedule, then the best time to train for whatever type of training it is, then it's obviously at any time you can. I would, uh, you know, always be careful with uh, working out in the middle of the night or uh, too late in the evening because, you know, if you mess up your sleep and you mess up your circadian rhythms, then I, I think, you know, it might not be that worth it. Like, I would wait for the weekend when you're free from work or something like that and then have uh, a workout at the optimal time uh, rather than to, like, really think that you need to work out every day even if I'm working out at midnight and uh, I'm going to bed at 1 a.m. or something like that. So I, I think... If you can choose, then work out for strength purposes in the afternoon. If you are doing cardio, then you can work out pretty much at any time. I wouldn't do cardio maybe like five hours before bed because if you raise your heart rate too much, then it can disrupt sleep quality. And the same applies to like hit cardio, stuff like that. Don't do like any super intense form of exercise at least four to five hours before bed. Cardio is fine if you do it in the morning because uh, it's good for actually kickstarting the circadian rhythm and increasing this uh, NAD recycling in the morning which is a great thing for the circadian rhythms and overall like metabolism but for strength training then you are stronger yes in the afternoon and uh, kind of definitely I wouldn't do like very intense heavy uh, strength training like in the morning you like you might actually be at a higher risk of injuries uh, if you are like immediately after waking up you're going to hit, hit the gym for some heavy weights like uh, of course it's better than nothing but if you can choose then yeah the best time to do so in the in the afternoon now in terms of the meal timing then i do think that uh, working out after uh, food is slightly superior at least for strength and maximum power so if, if you are doing cardio then you don't need to eat but if you are you know doing some sort of a weightlifting or powerlifting uh, type workout then you are always going to be more stronger <laughs> after uh, eating you know i've worked out fasted hundreds of times i've done strict one minute a day where i work out and then i eat but uh, it was never as effective for muscle growth or strength development as the method that i'm doing now which is i call the targeted intermittent fasting so i have a protein shake and then i work out and then i have uh, the food after the workout so that's a much more effective way because you're going to have more amino acids in your bloodstream so those amino acids reduce your muscle catabolism so you build more muscle as a result of that and you're probably also stronger because of just having more energy from that you could also eat like some simple carbohydrates before the workout uh, but i wouldn't have like a massive meal immediately before the workout so like i wouldn't eat like burgers and fries i wouldn't eat like massive pasta or even like a massive steak is probably too too heavy um uh, for, for the workout immediately if i were to you know eat something immediately before a workout then i would stick to something very easy to digest like either eggs cook some eggs maybe fish is even fine uh, but like a protein shake or something whey protein is the most bioavailable the fastest absorbing fastest digesting protein in the world and yeah i just slam a protein shake whey protein and then i'll be able to work out pretty much in you know less than an hour 30 minutes even like in five minutes if i want to all right next question we know that plastic in the kitchen is generally not healthy for cooking purposes what are some other like ingredients that we need to be careful with so yes plastic i would like not really use plastic for almost anything uh, i would certainly not use plastic to microwave things <laughs> not use plastic to put like hot or warm liquids or uh, warm food in the only safe thing that you can use plastic is like storing cold food in. And even then, you know, it's not the most optimal, but I wouldn't like really freak out about that. So if you store like some sort of uh, leftovers, you can store them in a plastic container in the fridge, but don't like heat up the plastic container when you are about to eat it. Or if you are like trying to warm it up, you would put it into like a stainless steel pot or ceramic pot or a pan or something like that before you uh, eat it. Um, but, you know, the, if you can choose, then obviously the BPA-free versions of plastic are a bit better than with BPA. But even then, BPA-free means that they just have something else <laughs> that, uh, you know, the marketing hasn't caught up with. Most people are careful with BPA because the kind of social awareness around BPA has reached a boiling point 
where the, the marketers of these companies are, okay, they know that BPA is bad, so we're going to replace it with something else. Uh, so we say BPA free, but we have, you know, BPS or BPY, whatever other, because, you know, there's hundreds of these different chemicals. They just put BPA instead of BPA, they'll have BPR, BPP, whatever. And it's as bad. It's just that people don't know that it's bad. So they think it's BPA free and think it's fine, but it has the other compounds that are equally as bad. So, so with that being said, I wouldn't use yeah, plastic for anything that is liquid and warm and hot. Cold is, you know, kind of fine, but again, it's not the most optimal. What you would what you could is the use is like glass glass is the kind of safest alternative or stainless steel that's another or ceramic so that's kind of the safest materials when it comes to other dangerous let's say compounds on the cooking ware then like teflon that uh, is used to coat the frying pans with that also contains the xenoestrogens and if you obviously what you, you know when you're using a frying pan then you're gonna use high temperatures that mobilize those xenoestrogens into your food so teflon is another one of those compounds that uh, i wouldn't use for frying pans out of the non-stick pans then like a stainless steel or a ceramic pan is again the most optimal method i wouldn't use like a cast iron steel pan either because the cast iron steel is just going to leach the iron into your food so you might be getting too much iron in that scenario as well maybe if you're anemic it's fine but most people, especially men, aren't. So for them, it actually increases the risk of heart disease, in my opinion. Like excess iron exposure is not good. <laughs> so cast iron pans aren't uh, healthy either. The healthiest frying pans are, yeah, like stainless steel or the uh, ceramic pans. So overall, stay away from all things that contain plastic. And uh, ideally, also be wary of the non-stick, uh, you know, pa pans or whatever, like the... Uh, spatula or something like that that can also be made of like some sort of silicon or something um, it's better than plastic obviously but um, you know if you can use then use like a wooden spatula that or uh, like some sort of iron spatula stainless steel uh, spatula again uh, which is much more like safer ingredient and the same actually like cutting boards that's something that I also recently learned that the cutting boards if they're made of plastic then you know if you're cutting with a knife then you're actually cutting into the the cutting board and you're cutting into the plastic so that also like you know you're pretty much exposing your food to those microplastics and you might actually like eat the same microplastics <laughs> if uh, you actually accidentally put it into your salad or something like that so the best cutting board again is also wooden cutting board so wooden is actually you know it's uh, the safest kind of uh, ingredient next question i've got an energy drink problem is that really bad for your health <laughs> well you know, when you look at the ingredients on energy drinks, uh, whatever, Monster or something like that, then, you know, most of the ingredients, they look nice, like B6 or niacin and other kinds of vitamins and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, you would say that, okay, these uh, vitamins and stuff like that are healthy for me. You know, yes and no. I mean, technically, the only harm of energy drinks just comes from the high amounts of caffeine. So one energy drink, like one monster has around like 150 milligrams of caffeine. You know, the Nocco, which is the smaller, like a more fitness brand, it's a smaller bottle, but it contains 180 milligrams of caffeine, which is a lot more. And I think, you know, the safe amounts of caffeine per day for an adult is generally around, you know, 200 uh 200 i think is a kind of a safe dose and up to like 400 milligrams is also fine but again you're kind of starting to push the envelope a little bit and your sleep quality will probably suffer if you get like 400 milligrams every day so technically if you drink like one energy drink that contains 150 milligrams of caffeine then it's not going to be unhealthy quote unquote it's just going to pretty much increase your caffeine levels in the blood that can disrupt your sleep quality and some people are also more sensitive to that they can get jittery there's nothing inherently bad about that except for the yeah like the high amounts of caffeine like of, of course younger individuals and some people can overdose on caffeine especially if they take powdered caffeine so that's why i'm not a fan of powdered pre-workouts because they just contain so many so much uh, caffeine and you can easily overdose on that without being careful but with energy drinks you still have to drink a lot of them and unless you're literally addicted to energy drinks that you're drinking four to five cans a day then uh, it's not it's not on it's not going to like 
harm your health. Granted that everything else is in check. And of course, if the energy drink contains sugar, then that's a kind of a different story. Like the knockos, they, those are sugar-free. They're sugar-free monsters as well. But if you're getting the regular uh, monster that contains the sugar as well, then that's that's unhealthy, yeah, because of the sugar. <laughs> the caffeine itself isn't that unhealthy in moderation. Yeah, people have different feelings about caffeine, but uh, if you look at the data, then caffeine alone in small amounts, 100 to 200 milligrams a day, there's no data that it's uh, harmful or that it would like be unhealthy. And actually, if you look at the data, then you know, coffee consumption, two to three cups of coffee a day is actually associated with a significantly lower risk of all-cause mortality and lower risk of heart disease and lower risk of liver cancer and those things. With coffee, it's obviously because of the polyphenols and the antioxidants inside the coffee. But the some of the effects might be mediated by the caffeine as well. So again, the sugar energy drinks are bad. If you drink like one to two, maybe I would I wouldn't I wouldn't drink any more than like one. At least personally, I wouldn't want to consume any more than 200 milligrams of caffeine per day. Uh, but if it's below that, then I don't see any reason why it would be like harmful. You know, it's it's caffeine and, you know, caffeine can have different effects in different people. Depends how you react and how you use it. Like if you drink like energy drink before a workout and you have a good workout, then it's like it might be a net positive because you're, you know, gaining getting more gains and more results at the gym <laughs> by increasing your energy and uh, alertness with uh, the caffeine all right next question what is the optimal amount of cardio so cardio i think is underrated for sure like many people in like longevity and the biohacking world they're almost like neglecting cardio <laughs> and they're just doing uh, weightlifting and stuff like that you obviously want to do both but if you look at the effect in risk reduction or the size of risk reduction then cardio or at least moderate exercise outperforms vigorous exercise and having higher cardio respiratory fitness alone outperforms having high muscle strength alone in terms of reducing all cause mortality risk so cardio is more effective in reducing heart disease risk and all cause mortality risk but if you combine them together then you see a greater reduction if that makes sense it's just that the cardio is going giving most of the results or a significantly higher proportion of those results. How much is too much? You know, technically, I would even suggest that at least in the short term, even overtraining with cardio uh, probably isn't going to be bad, like it, at least in the short term. Yes, you might lose some sleep. Yes, uh, you know, you might start to get some injuries or stuff like that. But... In terms of your biomarkers, all the biomarkers would generally improve if you're doing like a lot of cardio. Um, the only thing that might increase is some of those DNA methylation patterns. So what we do know from at least my own experience as well as some studies that overtraining or um, excessive exercise, whether that be weightlifting or cardio, then that can accelerate uh, the markers of biological aging. Now, whether or not it actually reflects actual biological aging or the speed of your biological aging is not clear, or at least there's no evidence that those clocks would actually you know, predict your mortality or your speed of aging. They just measure certain things. And we know that over-exercising accelerates those clocks, uh, if that makes sense. And, and, but fortunately, we do have like you know some studies, meta-analysis finding that even up to 800 minutes per week of moderate uh, exercise, which includes zone 2 cardio and hiking and walking and anything that is not uh, vigorous and anaerobic then even up to 800 minutes per day still gives you a reduction in heart disease and all cause mortality risk compared to getting 200 minutes per week so it's a linear reduction in the risk so the more moderate physical activity you do per week the lower your risk of all cause mortality and heart disease at least based on uh, the study, recent studies and meta-analysis that we uh, have. But the same isn't true with vigorous physical activity, so weightlifting or anaerobic cardio. So with that kind of exercise, you see a more like a J or U-shaped curve with zero amounts of vigorous activity being bad, but excess amounts of vigorous activity also being associated with increased risk. So somewhere in the middle, like, and uh, with weightlifting, it's generally around like 60 to 80 minutes per week, maybe up to 140 minutes at max 
and with vigorous exercise, which would probably include weightlifting plus high intensity exercise uh, or high intensity cardio, then it's going to be also somewhere around like 100. 50 minutes or 200 minutes at most uh, per week but there is no similar linear reduction the same way with moderate exercise so you know if you're doing 800 minutes of intense exercise per week then you are probably increasing your risk because of because of overtraining but doing zone 2 cardio or other forms of moderate physical activity up to 800 we don't have i haven't seen data about a thousand minutes per week but i would presume that it's still it still follows a similar trend that even th- even a thousand minutes per week of moderate physical activity like hiking, walking and zone 2 cardio output here as well, that even then you would probably see a reduction in the benefits. So what's the optimal amount is, you know, how much you can do almost or how serious are you are you are uh, in terms of um, reducing your risk. If you are really gung ho or, you know, super motivated to reduce your risk as much as possible, then yes, like 800 minutes per week apparently is the best in terms of reducing the risk. Do you need to do 800 minutes per week? You know, hard to say. You have to also look at other factors, how it's going to affect your sleep, how it's going to affect your, you know, stress levels and uh, those kind of things. And, uh, and your biomarkers, like people react differently to exercise or, you know, their biomarkers might react differently, at least in the extremes of exercise. But generally, your biomarkers will improve. It's just that, you know, at what point are you reaching the point of diminishing returns? At what point are you causing more inflammation and causing more oxidative stress uh, with uh, the overtraining? So you need to kind of find out, okay, how much can I do? And how much is uh, is my kind of point of diminishing returns? Me personally, you know, I do try to do at least two to three uh, workouts of zone 2 cardio per week which uh, generally involves like 30 to 45 minutes of zone 2 cardio uh, but obviously i walk every day as well so i'll walk every day at least one to two hours uh, i have like the standing work desk and the walking treadmill so i'll be i'll be able to work while i'm walking but obviously i walk outside as well go for walks in the park and stuff like that so i'll be getting you know per week i'll get uh, if i were to guess i would get at least 600 or five, 500 to 600 minutes per week of moderate physical activity. And with intense physical activity, I'll, I'll, I'll be getting like three 45 minute weightlifting workouts per week and maybe like a 20 minute high intensity cardio session per week. So that's in total gonna be 150 minutes per week, something like that of uh, vigorous physical activity. And I think that's a pretty good starting point, at least based on the evidence that you don't want to overdo intense exercise, but you can certainly overdo, not overdo, but you can still do a lot of moderate physical exercise. You can do hundreds of hours of moderate physical activity per week and still see benefits in risk uh, reduction. All right, that's it for this video. If you want to ask me a question in the future, then make sure you follow me on Instagram at Seamlund. But do you want to slow down aging and live longer? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to reverse their biological clock. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at seamlund.com and I'll send you the details.